Thank you very much for the fantastic invitation. It's a big pleasure to be here. Of course, I would like to be there in person, but it's very good to meet and hear many of the friends and, and collaborators over the years. So, today I would like to talk about uh, my perspective of uh, the uh, effort that has been going on for 20 years after the completion of the human genome. Of course, we know that the completion of the human genome has been given quite a lot of, uh, um, has been caused quite a lot of progress for many fields of uh, uh, science, biology, medicine, and uh, the um, achievement of the human genome has uh, truly produced a remarkable uh, progress uh, of uh, science. However, although we have uh, understood quite a quite a bit of how the genome works, and, and here I put uh, some of the main facts about the genome and uh, the variability between uh, individuals, uh, actually. Um, needs uh, uh, a little bit of uh, more studies, uh, particularly also because um, it will become obvious that only a minor part of the genome encodes for uh, uh, proteins. Clearly, over the years just after the completion of the genome project, various projects started to ask what is needed to characterize to better understand how the genome is uh, regulated. And immediately after the completion of the genome, the ENCODE project started, was announced in 2004. And in parallel, in, uh, here in Japan, with the other colleagues, we were starting the Phantom project. It was uh, quite uh, uh, different ideas. And uh, actually, at the end, it, came, it uh, turned out to be quite complementary to the ENCODE project. I also mentioned various other projects that have been uh, very, uh, very important to uh, complement the human genome. Uh, but I'm going to focus essentially on uh, on those two projects because I know uh, I know them better. I've been interacting, uh, particularly with ENCODE, and I've been uh, also deeply involved in the Phantom project. In the in the Phantom project, actually, we have been uh, focusing over the years to uh, understand what the genome is producing. We've been focusing on uh, uh, identification of uh, RNAs, capped RNAs, in order to capture all the RNAs that are uh, present in tissue as a complete uh, uh, copies of them, so the full length cDNAs. And uh, as everybody already knows, we identify, we and others, identi others uh, identify only 20,000, uh, 21,000 uh, protein coding genes. However, what was uh, striking at that time is that there were other transcript, uh, uh, particularly non uh, coding RNAs, and they were actually the majority of the transcripts that are present in the genome. Uh, at the beginning, we did not know so much about them, but year after year, um, many groups, uh, particularly focusing on the biology of uh, each of those uh, RNAs, uh, start to uh, start to study them and it become clear that a part of them, at least so far at the moment, uh, no more than four or five percent of them have been further studied and they regulate. They regulate chromatin, they regulate transcription, translation, they interact with the protein. So they do quite uh, different things, although for 95 percent of them we still do not know anything about. Here about uh, some numbers out of the phantom tree at the time it was mouse telling that 63% of the ortho genome is transcribed and uh, many are London coding RNAs, including quite a, a remarkable uh, number of sense anti -sense. Uh, Actually, we, uh, we, we uh, inferred 73% of genes show uh, some sort of uh, antisense. And for many of them, we still don't really know the type of uh, regulation. So this is one of the first images of the, of, of the, of the uh, how the genes are in the genome. With many exceptions, so we find the genes that start uh, RNAs that start in one gene and finish uh, in the downstream gene. We often find uh, for the first time at the time quite a uh, complex pattern with uh, genes uh, that uh, are spanning into uh, the other genes, antisense region, antisense of antisense, so quite complex. So, and we define uh, uh, as a transcription unit uh, everything that cluster uh, together on the exon. 
So in this case, with uh, so many different transcripts, we have only um, three transcription units for this specific example, and one gene forest, uh, and uh, where there is nothing we, we call a gene desert. So, but uh, uh, this also suggesting us that uh, um, uh, uh, there are many different transcripts, and the transcript variability still has to be um, fully, uh, fully uh, understood. Of course, uh, there were other groups, um, and this is a very inspiring work from uh, Tom Ginger. It's been a real pleasure to work with him over the years, uh, with him and his group over the years. And uh, this was a very inspiring uh, work because uh, this shows that um, compared to the cytoplasmic polyaplas uh, uh, RNA, and actually there are many more nuclear and the nuclear polyamanus RNAs. So this paper has, be, has been inspiring us uh, uh, for, for a long time with the idea that we should really try to uh, capture all of this uh, um, uh, difference that usually is not represented in our cDNA libraries uh, that uh, are commonly used to uh, clone uh, um, our, uh, to, uh, to identify our preferred genes. So a lot of uh, uh, transcription and um, this approach was complementary to what the ENCODE took. And here is uh, uh, one of the famous slides from the ENCODE one. And the strategy was uh, uh, totally different, was to identify 1% of the human genome, was to use some of the cell lines because they can easily be um, grown and, uh, and uh, um, distributed. And uh, actually, this has been a very important work uh, to develop technologies uh, to identify hypersensitive sites, uh, regions bound by chromos, by uh, um, regions of the chromatin bound by transcription factors. Uh, and uh, at the beginning, it was uh, all based on microarray hybridization, and uh, uh, suddenly sequencing start to uh, replace all of this. It's been uh, um, a very um, a very uh, you know longer technology marathon. Um, at the same time, we also develop technologies to map uh, promoters that actually it turned out to be a very complementary to many of the other technologies. This is the cage technologies, and to make the story short, essentially cage captures those randomly primed cDNAs and sequence uh, only the. Uh, initial part uh, of the transcript uh, that is very close to the initiation site. By doing this, we can essentially uh, sequence uh, at the, the initiation site. And with this, uh, we essentially map uh, gene expression, but also each promoter that drive expression in many, in, in many different tissues. And um, on the right, uh, there is a simple comparison showing the difference of cage that essentially focuses the signal on the initiation site with RNA sequencing that usually covers the, 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 the whole uh, body of the genes, but is not often uh, very efficient to capture the initiation site. And um, just to show you a brief um, um, example of alternative promoters, just to show that all the cage tags here, this is a phantom three many years ago, still shows that uh, genes may have uh, up to nine or 10 different uh, initiation sites, Many of them are uh, tissue and tissue specific. So, and actually, um, this is quite important to understand gene regulation because the set of transcription factor and the epigenome differs in each of the cell type. So, um, uh, we uh, did not uh, plan to, uh, we did not know that the next generation sequencing will develop so uh, vigorously and strongly, but uh, clearly, the uh, development of uh, the various technologies uh, has been really very welcome, not only to sequence genomes, but definitely to understand what the genome is doing by using DNA-seq, chip-seq, RNA-seq, cage, and many more uh, seq technologies that have really been enabled functional genomics. And of course, this curve shows uh, uh, the decrease of the cost. We would really welcome a further decrease of, of the cost that seems to be quite stable over the past uh, four or five years. And based on the sequencing, tech, uh, on, on sequencing, the next phase of the encoder had been uh, expanding, of course, going genome-wide and uh, including 147 cell types. 
And actually, there was some uh, uh, finding that were uh, similar to what uh, uh, was the, 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 the early observation of the, of, of the phantom, and particularly one that uh, has been uh, discussed very, very extensively, that 80 percent of the genome participate in some of the biochemical events. So it seems to do something, although we don't understand very well. Of course, uh, other parts of the genome are important for, uh, for understanding genetics and the, and the role of the GWAS. And uh, there is a complex, better understood the quantitative transcription factor chromatin RNA relationship, both in promoter and splicing. Transcription factor co-associate and uh, chromatin can be classified in multiple classes. This has been quite a, quite important uh, project to, to introduce new concepts to analyze the genomes. And here I just put some of the summary that uh, in particularly this 62% uh, here of uh, um, uh, the genome that produces some sort of RNA has been uh, quite similar to previous observation and uh, actually uh, tend to uh, converge with with observation on, in the phantom project, but of course also in, in other important projects. And so clearly pervasive transcription of RNA is there. RNA is a very important component, although we know still uh, very uh, little. So um, again, the phantom and the encode have been uh, um, evolving quite in parallel uh, without, uh, without any common planning, but often converging and comparing the data around at the end of the projects or when the data set were, were, were prepared. So in 2010-2011, uh, we started to think that we should uh, uh, prepare a map of uh, promoters uh, using CAGE from uh, as broad as possible collection of uh, primary cells and collection of tissue because we really need to have a, a collection of human of human uh, of human promoters and this was uh, the phantom fiber where we took 100 of primary cells and we follow up with the 32 of them with the time cost to see how the um, promoters and the, the promoter changes during the activation or various time courses and this is a little bit uh, a fairly complex slide so, so we cannot go in all the details of all the different cell types eh? There are more than 150 human primary cells and many more tissues here. But just to give you some impression of all the type of sample from the adipocyte immunology and the mesoderm, endoderm, ectoderm, the differentiation of neurons and so on. And this was quite important to, ident to identify the diversity of promoter and something else that I'm gonna comment later. In particular, we did for all those samples cage so with cage we can identify promoter and infer the type of network the transcription factors that are important that are enriched in the, in the promoter that are in, present in each cells for a subset rna sequencing small rna sequencing some other assays uh, to um, identify all those different cells and to have a, a first look at how looks this diversity. We've been uh, clustering um, variety of promoters that have a similar expression features and uh, uh, how do they map compare to the cells of origin. So we can see the whole diversity of promoter uh, activity here. But also what we can see is that those tend to cluster for uh, different cell types so immunocells and central nervous system and uh, um, placenta, epithelial, and mesenchymal cells. And uh, uh, I think that uh, this was a quite, a quite important exercise because we also found that uh, the cancer cell lines, and many of them were used during the ENCODE 1 and the ENCODE 2, they occupied quite specific space of the transcriptome. But this suggested that, that uh, to really broadly identify uh, the human biology, we really need, need to uh, identify and characterize many different cell types, in particular primary cell types, and from now on, as much as possible of uh, tissues out uh, of the human body. Um, some surprises when, when you um, use those uh, powerful technologies, usually you always find something new. One was that the uh, promoter architectures is, 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 uh, can be different in different tissues. So, so the same promoter can have a different modality. So for instance, in this 
In astrocyte, we find a, a only single starting site here, but if you look at the immune cell CD14 or CD4, the starting sites used migrate more upstream, and this is one of the encoder cell line, and everything moves even more upstream, and there is a, uh, nothing here from a, a promoter that has a, this sharp and has a, a data box. So the idea is that uh, promoter have sub-modalities of promoter. Within the very same promoter, you have a various elements that, that are differently active. Usually, data box uh, promote uh, transcription from, from a single position in the genome, and CPG island from a more distributed or broad uh, regions. And those can coexist in, in, in the same promoter. By counting uh, uh, here, essentially, one, two, and three groups, we had more than 223,000 uh, promoters uh, uh, in, in human, less in mouse, not because the mouse is more simple, but because we just did not uh, sample uh, as, as much. The other uh, things that we did not expect, we have already seen a little bit uh, with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with the Phantom, um, sorry, with the ENCODE 2 project that we can also characterize an answer by their uh, bidirectional transcription. And um, actually, because of the selection of the samples, they tend to be quite uh, tissue uh, specific. So, so the number of the enhancer that uh, the phantom identify is uh, much smaller than the number of the enhancer of the encoder. However, they tend to be, uh, uh, they have uh, some, 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 some good future because they, have, they are overrepresented in one cell tissue or, or group. And this may help you if you really are looking for enhancers that are very specific for, uh, for, uh, um, for a given set types. And uh, importantly, they also are important for, for genetics. And uh, we have been comparing the GWAS that are mapping in exon, and those are the, uh, the uh, various uh, uh, <laughs> diseases which are, they are related. So exon is a relatively small number if compared to the promoters uh, that is mostly out of the exons, but even more in the enhancers. So this has definitely been helping to uh, map uh, um, uh, and give some possible function to some of the uh, GWAS uh, over, over the years of following this paper. And again, um, after, after the Phantom project, there is always, always some ENCODE project, and this was a really, uh, remarkable achievement and really would like to congratulate with all the authors and uh, of those papers and uh, uh, actually the number the number of the cells and the number of the data set the number of biosamples being massively expanded 503 biological tissue types and I would like to say that probably the, the biggest achievement is in here is the, is the um, uh, registry of candidate assist regulatory elements so the CCRE and uh, um, so be, because they uh, definitely um, can help us to understand what is happening here in the genome what is uh, uh, regulated in the genome and also uh, 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 yeah, and also in different cell types so the registry is uh, massively uh, large with uh, more than 926,000 candidate uh, system regulatory element, and again less in mouse uh, again because the the sample uh, the sampling was lower, and they cover a, a remarkable part of the human genome, about eight percent, and uh, also they cover eighty percent of element marked by chromatin marks, and a part of the uh, previous gene code and phantom collection. So essentially. As always, the data tend to converge, which is good, and uh, is also telling that uh, those uh, complementary projects are always very, uh, very important. Another paper that I like very much is uh, the landscape of chromatin loops in the human genome, which brings uh, for 24 cell types everything in 3D, identifying uh, at high resolution uh, uh, 125,000 loops with variation among chromatin loops in different cells, which is also quite, quite important, and also various features about uh, the uh, role of uh, enhancers in genes that are associated with disease and uh, associated with uh, features of the, uh, of, uh, the in, in, in the conformation. 
And uh, a third uh, important finding, and again, I'm not trying to uh, uh, summarize comprehensively all the findings here, but just uh, some, some of the most important findings is, is anyway, is the RNA binding proteins. This is only in two cell lines, but the, the extent of, of the experiment is very remarkable and it identifies quite extensively uh, with the different technologies what RNA binding proteins actually bind. And this is very important to, to understand the regulation at a different level from the um, uh, promoter and the enhancers level. But also, uh, particularly our group is, uh, is using this very, very extensively to understand the motifs in many of the long coding RNA that we are studying. And uh, particularly, we'll have some, some example later if there is time to discuss them. So here is for the ENCODE and uh, a little bit of what uh, we are uh, uh, working on uh, the lono coding RNAs because uh, they need to really, uh, they really need some, some effort. We have been recounting the lono coding RNA uh, in 2017 with Chung. At the time when we published, uh, uh, we found some uh, uh, divergence with the gene code. We have been uh, discussing after this. I did not update my slide, apologies for this. And uh, actually um, those phantom cat that uh, for which we found uh, um, evidence from a cage promoter and uh, um, additional chromatin marks are quite uh, remarkable. This is a robust data set if you want to look at the permissive, so the aggressive way to count them, there is even more. Um, importantly, also the long non-coding RNAs are mapping, um, um, in, uh, have interesting mapping data compared to the disease. So if you look at the expression of the non-coding RNAs, versus the traits, which is a um, trace that have uh, some uh, map. So we find that uh, very often the long coding RNAs that uh, are mapping on a trait that is important for um, some brain disorder, see a list here, are actually expressed in the region and in the cells that are important for that disease. So there is a quite, a, quite a strong correspondence. This is a, a zoom in of a map for all the tissues and that we don't have the time to discuss today, but actually we found uh, this also to be the case for, the, for all the other organs. So diseases and especially coding RNA tend to, um, tend to uh, correlate. I will skip this and go into a little bit our summary slide on the possible function of uh, the lono coding RNA inferred by um, genome conservation, uh, particularly transcriptionization region conservation is this number, Cons conservation of exome, lono coding RNA implicated in GWAS traits and the lono coding RNA implicated in EQTL. So it's about 3,000, 2,000 and 13,000 each. So in total, uh, we uh, have some uh, suggestion that 19,000 of lono coding RNA may have some potential function if you also assume that conservation is associated with, the, with, uh, with function. With this in mind, we have been uh, over the years uh, uh, running the Phantom 6 with the idea to uh, knock down lono coding RNAs. Uh, see uh, here on the on the left, we knock down and we see that uh, there is uh, something happening after no, after knocking down. Let's say transcription starts, and uh, the whole network of the, all the cells will work. So actually, we do this uh, systematically. We analyze uh, uh, the lono coding RNA to knock down. We do perturbation with a gap mesh, so antisense that acts also on the non coding that are in the nucleus. We extract the RNA prepare a library, we sequence, and then we do the bioinformatics analysis, and then we jump here on the right side where we see the pattern. So this is by knocking down about a 250 long encoding RNAs and looking at which pathways, which go term have, uh, have been changing. At the same time, also looking at the cell morphology proliferation um, with uh, uh, some robot uh, inclusive measuring cell uh, growth. And we can see um, interesting is that uh, there is not uh, just a stress response after transfection, 
but there are various aspects like splicing, translation, cell cycle, metabolism. So they seem to do quite a, quite a bit of things. A caveat, the, the, the response is not always strong. You need to replicate the study very carefully and um, uh, very, very often the antisense may differ also because we don't know all the structure of the non-coding RNA by using two different antisense against uh, what we think is non-coding genes. We may hit a two different splicing isoform. Anyway, um, the paper was just published in general research and uh, the data is all available. Please uh, feel free uh, to uh, download the data and there are several thousand cage libraries here as well so and you can you can download and check uh, and and uh, uh, draw your your conclusion we have few few more studies in the pipeline with uh, uh, ips cells on 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 a similar work that have, that have not yet been published this is a little bit of the interrogation of the function. This is not only genomics, but it's also uh, experiment after scratching cells, how long does it take to regenerate with a different antisense? And it seems that for, for, for this gene, one antisense, um, this antisense of this zinc finger, um, actually uh, one antisense uh, inhibit quite efficiently the uh, migration of cells. And we've been looking at uh, cell migration and cell proliferation and uh, correlating uh, cell growth and proliferation with the GoTerms and CAG uh, 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 pathways that, uh, that, 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 that are uh, um, uh, coming out from the genomics analysis. And clearly we see that when we see less growth, the, uh, the knocking down non coding RNA cause changes in genes related to apoptosis or apoptosis immune system. And otherwise, genes, if there is a grow, increase of growth or proliferation, there is about cell cycle and DNA replication. So this seems to make, to make sense. We also been working quite a bit to characterize uh, um, low non-coding RNA that are in the chromatin. Particularly, we know that there is a, a considerable amount of low non-coding RNA attached to the, to the nucleus in the chromatin. Those are some of the numbers. And uh, with the former postdoc of my lab, Alessandro, and other members have been developing a method to cross-link um, RNAs bound to the chromatin, bound to the uh, to, uh, genomic DNA. And after various steps, the key point is to add a link that will ligate from one side specifically to the RNA, at the other side specifically to, to DNA. This is all in, in the cross-link nuclei, so uh, molecules don't move too much, so we think we capture quite a lot of the uh, situation as uh, it is, uh, um, um, cross-linked. After the cross-linking and the transforming the RNA into cDNA and putting our linkers, we sequence uh, in, uh, uh, in the Illumina and uh, we do one or two lanes per each library and we, we uh, study this whole interactum. And actually um, is a pattern that somehow has a correlation with the, with the high C pattern, but of course one side is RNAs, the correlation is between 0 0.5 to 0 0.6, but also we see quite a, quite, a, quite a different things as well. We found quite a lot of uh, uh, interaction within the same chromosomes between the RNA on the Y axis and DNA on the X axis. And this interaction is usually caused by introns of protein coding genes. So this is quite sort of surprising, so introns are often not degraded and they interact with the, uh, along the same chromosome. The other are those uh, uh, distributed uh, uh, spots, often in green, and then often are long non-coding RNAs uh, uh, or non other non-coding uh, uh, RNAs that uh, show some uh, various interaction. Those are then the number of the events, huge number of interactions, and including also non-coding RNAs. And this is one example. Neat one that is not so active in mouse embryonic stem cells, so it interacts here with its own locus on the chromosome 19 and a little bit outside. But if you look on uh, uh, oligodendrocyte progenitor cells, this is all mouse, 
it interacts not only with its own locus, but with different uh, regions of the same chromosome, and also in trans with different chromosomes. So we have uh, hundreds and hundreds of those uh, graphs. If you look at the, at the paper, also just uh, uh, recently out in Nature Communication, you can find all the data there as well. There is some uh, uh, specific uh, um, um, uh, direction of those interaction. RNA chromatin interaction are enriched uh, at, T, at the TAD boundaries. And also there is an effect of, on the, the distribution. So the, the interaction of RNA within the same TAD is more, is larger than, though, than the interaction outside the same TAD. So it's telling us that the dose uh, and any anyway, those interactions are quite um, are, are probably uh, have some uh, some uh, biological meaning which we still do not understand. And importantly, also what we see is important role of uh, repeat element. We don't know how important it is, but the repeat element, if compared to um, uh, non-repeat uh, um, uh, transcript, they tend to uh, distribute over long range distance along the, the chromosome. And this is all statistically relevant for sine, line, and altr element. Repeat elements. And uh, I just to bring here in the last few minutes uh, one example of repeat elements that are embedded in, uh, in a transcript. And this is one repeat element embedded in this antisense in red. And uh, actually, once uh, we overexpress the antisense, uh, it does not affect the level of the sensor RNA, but it affects the level of protein, so it overexpress the uh, cause overexpression of the protein. This was published before, but actually, what uh, uh, and the, actually this is caused by a sign element, sign B two element. If you take this out, we don't see this effect anymore. So what we've been studying with uh, Harshita still unpublished work is that this is not only one exceptional RNA. But we have a whole class of sign B2 RNAs, but that but also have a human uh, uh, repeat element embedded in, in the transcripts that are um, effective to, to enhance protein. So this is a class in the mouse, is a class in the human, but we've identified also in Arabidopsis, in horse, in the species, in human. And actually, they work in different species. So repeat element. Enhance embedded in antisense, enhance protein expression of the targeted RNA in different species. And uh, is this caused by uh, primary sequence? And uh, by looking at the sequence, we believe it's not, it's mostly, look, uh, it's mostly a combination of motifs. And uh, actually, we just show very briefly using a model of COX 7B, that is a hyper insufficient gene that. In medaka fish, the mouse uh, element can rescue a phenotype induced by morpholino that I need with splicing here. And uh, a mouse assigned B2 can actually enhance the translation of the um, fish protein and rescue the phenotype. Of course, uh, this is quite interesting of, uh, for future application in the in the human, and again, please do not underestimate the importance of repeat, repeat element. Now, perspective, everything is gonna move a single cell, and we just uh, uh, published last year the uh, cage that works in single cell. First with the C1, we see similar things in the 10X. We identify enhancers. Uh, bidirectional enhancers, uh, but actually in each cells, enhancers are essentially monodirectional. They are not bidirectional in each cells. On average, they are bidirectional if you look at cell population. There's a good correlation with the DNA's hypersensitive site and the chromatin marks. So essentially, we can map uh, in the in a single cell traits, identify promoters, and and going to um, genetics uh, uh, working with single cell, in particularly. The concept here is that uh, we will uh, um, you know, map those regulatory elements uh, correlated to the SNP, uh, try to understand the expression QTL in each of the specific cell, uh, cell type. All 
has been uh, going very very quickly here. I just like to mention that uh, this is also part of the of the of the human cell atlas, and there is no uh, no need probably to discuss very extensively the the human cell atlas here. And uh, but we are also quite uh, strongly engaged with with this project. There is a, a human cell atlas uh, activity in Japan with a collection of data starting from uh, various hospital, and we are looking forward to do this um, and uh, um, some general details of how the project will, will go. And there's also a human cell atlas initiative in Asia. We're gonna have the next meeting later this month in, a, in, a, in, in China, so please stay, stay tuned to, um, uh, if you are in Asia, please contact us if you want to, 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 to be a part of this. And finally, I would like to introduce the, the Human Technopole, one institute in Milan, where I'm progressively moving a, a good part of my activity in, in, in this year and, in the, uh, and more in the coming years. So thank you very much for your attention. This uh, was done in collaboration with, uh, with many, and uh, um, there is no time, but I just leave this um, here for any questions that you may have. Thank you very much for your attention.